I want to talk about uh, what's wrong with the bag model of uh, ready trajectories and how they can be derived actually from hyperbolic geometry. The bag model consists of a circular bag of radius r and it has an unusual property that the pressure p is constant throughout. This has been dubbed the magic property of the bag, the constant pressure. Well, <clears throat> the bag model allows the masses and radii of uh, quarks to be determined, and we will do so considering the internal energy as being given by h bar squared divided by 2m r squared, and the mass of a quark, m, is the sum of several factors. The first, the mass of three quarks, 3m, the mass of a proton, sorry, plus the internal energy, or the average kinetic energy, plus the volume work. This is the volume work at constant pressure, okay? And this is the mass of a proton according to the bad model. So, we want now to determine the stationary value of the mass of the proton with respect to r, that is the minimum radius that the bag can assume. So we differentiate the m in the r is equal to cubed, sorry, plus 4 pi. Okay? This is cubed. And this has to be zero. And from this, we determine the minimum radius of the bag to be to the one fifth. Okay? So, given the pressure, it fixes the volume, or the radius in this case. And inserting this back into the internal energy comes out to 5 thirds h bar squared over 2 n r minimum. Okay. We call this pressure, we call this internal energy, but it doesn't seem very much like an internal energy. It's average kinetic energy. So where does all this come from? Is a question that someone can ask. At this point, we go back to thermodynamics and the doctrine of latent heat, dq is equal to L, v, uh, L rule, v in dv plus cv in dt. This is latent and specific heat, or heat capacity in this case. If we subtract the workout, we get the change in the internal energy, which is given by that. And if we employ the copper equation, dp in dt, v constant is now v over t, we can write this as a partial differential equation, v e in d v at t constant equals t dp in dt at v constant minus p. To obtain differential equation, we have to introduce an equation of state. So I'll write the equation of state here because I'll come back to it afterwards. Between internal energy, pressure, and volume. S 
small s is called the Grüneisen parameter. And for a system uh, at three dimensions, s belongs to the interval of one third to two thirds. Two thirds non relativistic, ultra relativistic, one third. And if we introduce this into here, we get a differential equation. dt minus d or s d e in d b at the constant. This differential equation we can solve by the method of characteristics. We did this last time. And the characteristics are dt over t equals minus s d v over v equals d e over v. And we get two independent solutions. A1 is t v to the s, and the other is e v to the s. Okay, and we can write the general solution as e is equal to v to the minus s times some arbitrary function of v t. Yes. Okay. Now, there is a theorem saying that as t goes to zero, the system can either condense or have a zero point energy or pulse the system. So in one case, we have E equals some constant, which is this, times V to the minus S. And this implies that dE is less than zero, and this will not condense. You have remaining repulsive interactions. Or, in the second case, we can introduce the equation of state into here, and we come out with P equals S, a constant, v to the minus s plus 1 equals another constant times t 1 plus 1 over s. dE in dV now, that t constant is greater than 0, and this system will condense. Notice that p is a function of t alone in this case, and uh, it can be made independent of v, and this will condense. So, it's apparent that what we're dealing with in the bag model is the first case. And if we put V equal to R cubed, and S equal to 2 thirds, this will be R to the minus 2 dependency on the internal energy, which is precisely that. Okay. So, it seems that everything is coherent, except for this point here now. Uh, we want to show that uh, thermodynamics cannot obtain any minimum values for thermodynamic quantities. It cannot give R explicitly as a function of P. And in order to do so, we look at the second law, which is dQ is equal to dE plus PdV. But for P, we can put in uh, S, V, D, V over V. Now, if we look for integrating factor of this, we can find it quite simply by multiplying both sides by V to the S. And what we come out with is this is equal to V, E, to V. S. So this is actually an adiabatic relation that we have. dQ is equal to zero, e v s is a constant. And moreover, if we know that dQ is T V S, we obtain uh, this relation, but we can also put in 
the relation between uh, T and E, and we come up with D, T, V to the S. So the adiabatic condition says that T, V to the S is a constant. Okay? That means that as the volume goes up, the temperature goes down in an adiabatic system, like the expansion of the universe. But here we have a problem, because I've already fixed R. And therefore, V fixed, T is fixed. So, in this case, adiabats will coincide with isotherms. So, in the PB plane, we have things adiabats and isotherms. <coughs> adiabats are more, uh, have steeper slopes than isotherms, except at absolute zero where they coincide. So, here, what we're saying by this, is that with V constant, T is constant. So these would collapse into parallel lines, which is impossible except at absolute zero. So this is impossible. The pressure cannot be fixed a priori because that would lead to a coincidence of adiabats and isotherms. So, uh, microscopically, what does this mean? Once we fix the volume, or a length, we can, through Compton, Compton's relation, we fix the mass. There is no universal mass, and there is no universal length. So, this is quite impossible. This relation is quite impossible. P cannot be pressure, uh, uh, constant pressure. Now, what's interesting is that if we don't consider this constant pressure and we rearrange this, we have we have R cubed is equal to two-thirds PV equals HR squared over 2MR squared, which is equal to E. Okay? This is just by rearranging this. We have a cube here, a square here. This is the factor of two-thirds to make this the volume for pi over 3 times R cubed. And this relation here is none other then this relation for this is equal to two-thirds. So the minimization of the mass of the proton with respect to the radius is none other than deriving the equation of state. Okay? So, in this sense, what we have now here is that this thing here becomes the enthalpy, H, which is 5 thirds CV to the minus 2 thirds. And this is the relationship between enthalpy and mass, not the energy and mass. And this is what the bag model says. Okay, now let's turn our attention to what the bag model says about strings. And in particular, uh, how determines the masses of these strings and the model involved. The sphere now becomes elongated into a uh, cigar-shaped uh, ellipse, ellipsoid, which is rotating at a frequency the model is that of quarks and antiquarks situated at the ends of this tube. The pressure again is held constant, P is a constant. And the forces between these, which are called the color forces, are nothing but filaments of tube fluxes, which are enclosed to this. So P equal to a constant 
according to the Banks theorists, is the condition that this does not become unstable and contract, that the pressure is needed to keep these strings and the tube finite. So what we have now, a length of the tube of 2R0, the maximum rotational frequency of the maximum distance, R0, is equal to C over omega. And uh, now they want to minimize the uh, mass at a constant angular momentum. They have a mass, uh, they have a momentum, angular momentum coming from the strings at the extremes, which is MCR. Then there's an additional angular momentum as M R squared omega. Okay? And what they do now is to uh, uh, hold this constant and uh, minimize the mass with respect to R. But the angular momentum contains R. So they can't hold the angular momentum constant and uh, minimize mass with respect to R. Now, uh, what they do, in a sense, is to consider the total angular momentum, which has no meaning. Total doesn't mean anything. And what they do is they camouflage it by using a volume, which is a volume of the free space, then they break it up into an area which is constant, from 0 to R0, twice this, times VR. And then they specify that the area will contract according to this. Beta is the uh, velocity over the velocity of light. And they come out with an answer of R0 and this is the volume they work with this is wrong and I'll show you why very simply the energy using this formulation if I consider a constant energy density, epsilon, and I can write the internal, the energy of a string is equal to 2 R0. And I use the relation that Vc is equal to R over R0. And I come out with uh, the result that this is equal to I epsilon R0. I do the same thing for the angular momentum, which is 2 R0. Which is V divided by C squared. Here I'm using the mass is equal to the energy density uh, divided by C squared, the mass density. Again, 1 minus V squared over C squared in dr. And this comes out to be pi over 2 omega squared over epsilon C squared. Okay? This is wrong because it says that the angular momentum or this total angular momentum will decrease as the frequency increases, which is impossible. The angular momentum must increase with the frequency, not decrease with it. So here already, we don't have to substitute in uh, to eliminate, uh, this would be R0 squared. And when we eliminate this with this, we come out with J is equal to a constant times E 
squared, which is the relationship we were looking for. But this is wrong, because it, it, there is nothing, there is no meaning to integrating uh, j over from zero to r, because r This is the condition V over C. R appears in conjunction with omega. So we can consider this an integration of our frequencies from 0 to C over omega, which has no meaning. Do one or the other. So it actually, this is a using this integral is just a camouflaged way of uh, integrating j over all frequencies except for omega, leading to the conclusion that as the frequency increases, the angular momentum will decrease. So this is not correct. Okay? And I also made a mistake following this, so it's not very interesting. So does this relationship hold? And if so, where does it hold? And this is a very beautiful thing at this point. We know that there's conservation of angular momentum with system of no torque, which means mr squared omega equals a constant. I'll put a zero on m now because m is the rest mass. So this is uh, this is angular, uh, conservation of angular momentum in Euclidean space. Now, if we look at a, uh, a non-Euclidean metric, that is, a Euclidean metric in the plane would look like this. Okay? But when we leave the Euclidean geometry, things become distorted out of proportion. And if we introduce a stereographic distortion, we come out with a hyperbolic metric. This is the distortion factor. That means that as we go out further and further out on the disk, systems seem like they're contracting, becoming smaller. Whereas if this were plus, we would have a stereographic uh, increase, meaning that stereographic projection onto a plane from the North Pole would lead to ever increasing distances. Here, which is the opposite with a minus sign, and this is a stereographic um, metric. Let us consider the distance here, and if we do so, uh, we can use Fermat's principle that the integral of this is to be a constant. And notice, I can also take this out, put this one, dr squared, and write this as phi prime squared, where phi prime is equal to d phi in dr. Okay? Now, if you look at this and you want to minimize it, you can see immediately that phi, the variable phi is missing. So this is called a cyclic variable. When this, this phi is missing, you know that there is an integral of motion uh, to this immediately. And we can find that just simply by differentiating. I call this factor lambda. And if I differentiate this with respect to phi prime, uh, phi prime, I get d phi is equal to 1 minus r squared. And here it comes out square root of that, which is
r squared phi prime, 1 plus r squared phi squared. Now this has to be a constant, okay? So I call this constant j divided by c, j the angular length of it. And this is constant. Now, I can resolve this equation for phi prime, and doing so, I come out with j equal to m zero r squared omega one minus. This is the condition that r be periodic r zero sine omega t plus phi phase. Okay. If I impose a periodic solution, I come out with this. Okay? Now, this equation has also been derived in general relativity, but the difference is that the metrics here and one in general relativity uh, are different, and therefore the general relativity metric is wrong. It's got a constant, um, it's got a constant uh, curvature which is C in this case, C being the curvature. As C tends to infinity, this goes to zero, then I get back my Euclidean metric. So in the large, when we are speeds much smaller than C, things appear in the Euclidean manner, and there's no problem. Now, the interesting thing is, is that in this space, R is equal to R zero, hyperbolic tangent of r over r zero. Bar meaning this is the hyperbolic measure of the radius, this is the Euclidean measure. So that in this case, this would be a straight line segment in this hyperbolic space. If I introduce this into here, you can see that this is going to be uh, secant squared r. This is tangent squared. Tangent squared times cosine squared is a hyperbolic sine, and this will come out to be m zero r zero squared omega hyperbolic sine squared r over r zero. Okay? You can say, well, that's all well and good, but what does this mean? It means that this the area of a hyperbolic circle is r zero squared sine hyperbolic sine squared r over r zero. Okay. So the angular momentum is m zero omega divided by four pi times the area of a hyperbolic circle, and you would expect this because j is the cross product of r and momentum. Now what's interesting here is that if you introduce m equals m0 divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared, which is equal to m cosine, hyperbolic cosine of r minus r0, you square this into here, so m squared is equal to m0 squared, and now I can write I have about a cosine as sine squared r over r zero plus one. Okay? I eliminate the hyperbolic sine between the two of these, and lo and behold, you get precisely the Reggie trajectories. I can express it as j equals the slope and square minus the intercept. Okay? That's what I get by eliminating the two because I come out with uh, j. Now, the hyperbolic sign I can put in n minus n zero square from here and divide 
find m zero squared. This goes up with that. I can read off alpha prime is equal to r squared omega m zero and alpha zero is equal to m zero squared m zero sorry r omega squared. Okay. Now what does this mean? Well, if I take a look at this, this is nothing other than the Euclidean measure j is equal to m0 r squared omega. So this is the Euclidean measure of the angular momentum. j0. And this must be the hyperbolic measure of the angular momentum. And one of the problems in general relativity is that if this is conserved, this will not be conserved <coughs> because it contains this factor in the denominator. Okay? But what is conserved is alpha equals j, which is conserved. Uh, sorry, alpha minus j, which is constant. And that is the hyperbolic definition of the conservation of angular momentum. So what these trajectories mean, when I plot j versus m squared, is nothing more than a statement of conservation of angular momentum in hyperbolic space. The interesting thing, when I wanted to put numbers into this thing, it all checked out quite interestingly. For instance, a k meson has a negative interslope, an intercept of, uh, uh, well first let me, before the, it has a negative intercept, so I took that as an example. Then, if I divide this by this, or the opposite, alpha zero, divided by alpha prime, uh, this is 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.8, okay? This is in GEVs to the minus 2, so this comes out to be something 500 MeV. Then you go and check what the K-meson weighs, and its energy uh, is, its mass is 4, 97.7 plus or minus 1 over c squared. And that is almost identical to this quantity here. It's amazing <coughs> that it comes out so well. If you assume that it has a radius of 10 to the minus uh, 13 centimeters, or 1 Fermi, then you get the slope of the trajectory as alpha prime is equal to 0 0.8. And use this to the minus 2, so we did here. You get a frequency of omega is equal to 1.24 times 10 to the 22 hertz. And this is something of the order 10 to the 8th times larger frequency than uh, visible light. So finally, we can determine the intercept if we don't know it from this relation here, we know the frequency, we know the radius and the mass, and we come out with 0 0.225. The value we introduced was 0 0.2, so we're pretty close. And that says that the mass, the k mass squared, will lie on the axis of the, uh, of the j m squared plot, and it certainly does. So, uh, now, the thing is, is that when m becomes proportional to m, j will vanish because there is no, in a state of rest there is no motion and uh, the angular momentum vanishes in this case. So, what we've shown in a sense is that the range of trajectories that is j proportional to m squared, 
is a relativistic effect. It comes from hyperbolic geometry, the definition of this. We determined the frequency of this rotating bag, which they could not do, because they integrated over all. Uh, and uh, so in this sense is that this is completely coherent with the fact that um, when J vanishes, there is no this uh, R will become zero and there is no motion at all. So I guess I'll stop here and